unwarranted, um, unwarrantedly sharing information that was damaging to the security of the country I came from. What would happen to me? What would the government do? Yes, they would either they would recall me and uh, have a trial, and I would be executed, wouldn't it? Right? When we have treason, a traitor is not giving any mercy. I mean, they don't put him in jail for uh, 20 or 30 years. <laughs> I don't know that they do that uh, for uh, treason. Treason is very serious. Now, let me ask our, uh, let's ask ourselves a question. If we are here to be the ambassadors from heaven and to be a representative of Jesus Christ, have we ever betrayed that trust? By com how would you describe betraying that trust? How could we do that? By claiming the name Christian, but then living a life which doesn't match our words at all. That would, that's a very open um, thing. And, and have we ever done that? Yes. Have we ever failed to, to represent God properly? And is that not treason? But what has God done for us, even though we deserve eternal death for that? He's given us his son. So even though we have betrayed him, should this be an encouragement to continue betraying God? This would be an encouragement to be, uh, truly repent and be faithful to that and receive the power of God to be faithful. So when we talk about our mission in this world to be true ambassadors for him, we're talking about the woman of Revelation 12. She's the one clothed in the sun, and those who are truly God's children are to be his ambassadors. We're to be clothed with the sun, which is the glorious gospel. We are to live in faith and talk faith. Every time we complain, every time we and, uh, um, share um, mistakes of our brethren and prop, what we consider to be a, uh, an imperfect course of the, the church of God. What are we doing? Are we not being traitors to our government? When we are, don't support and seek to um, improve things rather than being just a, a messenger, a, a newsboy about the mistakes of others in the church? Aren't we traitors? Do we not betray the, the name uh, and the cause of God with this? Yes, we do. We are not faithful ambassadors. And we need to consider, God has called us to be messengers from heaven, ambassadors of heaven, and that message that we have is the message of reconciliation. So God has called us to be ambassadors for his kingdom. So when we think about our duty and our work here, we have to also look now at the grander scope of the whole issue of the great controversy. Let's look now at the church, the woman of Revelation 12, for just a moment. We'll go there and look at some of the things. We're going to go in more detail later, but I want to look at Revelation 12 and read a few things and look at where the great controversy came from. So we see from the beginning there was appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. When we look at this vision, do we include the angels with this woman? If we don't, I would la ask you to consider that, because the true worshipers of God, where are they? Where were they? Were they not in heaven even before this world was created? We have here in the woman, the faithful, the pure uh, worshipers of God. And there was a controversy in heaven, and we see that also played out here on earth. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. We have the second wonder now. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon was raw, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for her, for to devour her child as soon as 
it was born. So we have here the great controversy being revealed in heaven. Now, when did this great controversy occur? What do you think? Well, we're going to have some evidence to show that this controversy occurred before man was created, before the earth also was put into the picture. First, though, let's look at verse 7 because it says, again, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore for them in heaven. And we're going to go to verse 9 now. It says, the great dragon was cast out, that old servant called the devil, and Satan was deceived of the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So comparing verse 3 with verse 9, what can we say about the angels, especially the angels of God and the angels of the devil? Do we have any explanation of the symbolism of the angels here uh, referred to in this text? Do you notice what are angels symbolized as in verse 3? Stars, right? So I said he drew a, a third of the stars of heaven. Verse 4. And in verse ten, 9, it says, And his angels were cast out with him into the earth. So we see here that there was a time when the devil was cast out of heaven. And when was that? When do you think that was? Was that after or before creation? Before creation. Okay, we have evidence of that in different places, and we're going, not going to go there this morning because uh, of time, but I'd like to mention a few things for your benefit because we see here that Satan rebelled against the authority of Jesus, and this is found in uh, the story of redemption one of the first paragraphs of that book. So now, as we look at the picture that we have before us, there was a great rebellion in heaven. And could somebody turn down the heat? It's too hot in here. Um, so we, we have now to look at the, uh, some other texts in the scripture. But let's think for a moment about what, how this all happened. We read in Isaiah that in the heart of Satan there came up pride. We read about that in other texts also um, in uh, Ezekiel 28 and we see different things that happen in uh, the life of, of Lucifer where pride came into his heart. And now, what happened when um, this pride came into Lucifer, Lucifer's heart. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will, make my, I will sit, my, uh, sit upon the throne of God. Did God now, um, what choices did God have in dealing with this subject, with this problem? You know, Satan was going around, Lucifer at that time, going around heaven implying that God was authoritarian, that he was a dictator, that he was giving undue uh, privileges to Michael, Christ, at that time, and was um, not giving him the due respect. So he was planting seeds of doubt in the angels of heaven. Now, how would you deal with somebody who's trying to defame your name? What would you do? Well, a lot of people go around and they defame the other person's name. We see that in politics. This is what politicians do. Well, one person gives you a slam, you try to give him a better one. So this was what was going on. This is politics as usual in the world. But does God work by politics and by defaming people? Could this be God's plan? No, he didn't do that. He couldn't do that because that's not his character. That's not the way God works. And that's not the way God's people are going to work either. So what did God do? He knew what was in the heart of Satan. He knew what was happening there. But how is he going to reveal that? We understand reading between the lines and understanding also direct statements from the spirit of prophecy. God called a meeting in which 
Well, first of all, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Before he even called a meeting of all the angels, he called a meeting with his son. And what did God say in that meeting with his son? We read it in the first page of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the first part. The first phrase there, what does it say? And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion and so forth. So what did God do? He knew that Satan, Lucifer, was planting seeds of doubt in the heavenly host. And he called a meeting with his son and he said, let us make man in our image. Now think about that statement clearly. Who was he talking to? I don't know if you've ever read any uh, uh, apologetics or uh, thoughts from Jewish writers and uh, authors. They have a trouble with this text. Because who is God talking to? Let us make man in our image. Because they're not recognizing the presence of the Son in this verse. They say it, he must have been talking to the angels. Let us make man in our image. Now, if God was talking to the angels in this verse, what does that imply? That implies that God is equal with the angels and the angels are equal with God. Now, what was Satan planting in the minds and hearts of the angels in heaven? Was that not what he was planting in their minds and hearts? So to say in this verse that God must have been talking to the angels is saying exactly the same thing that Satan was saying in heaven. Now, go to verse chapter 3, and when Satan came from heaven, what did he tell Eve? In verse 5, for God knoweth that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what did Satan do with Adam and Eve? When he, what did he plant in the heart of Eve? That you'll be like gods. And that's exactly what he was doing in heaven. So if we say in this verse, in chapter 1, verse 28, that God was talking to the angels, we're saying the same thing that Satan said to Eve, and the same thing that he said to the other angels in heaven. Very interesting idea. Very interesting way of looking at it. So God was not saying to the angels, but he was saying to his son, let us make man in our image. Now, what happened when God made that decision? Well, let's look before that. Before that, God knew that Satan was having pride in his heart and he had to reveal that pride and that uh, character to the angels and that revelation would cause a conflict. And that's what we see in the war in heaven. There was a conflict. What was it over? What was that conflict about? So when God called this meeting, he knew that it would be an offense to Lucifer because Lucifer was not called. Because Lucifer couldn't be called. Because if God was going to make man in his own image, and we read in the first, one of the first comments in the Bible commentary, if you read here under um, this verse, um, let me see, where is that? Here it is under 127. It says, all heaven took deep, a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man, human beings, were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. So man was created as a new and distinct order and he was going to be created in the image of God. But Lucifer could not be invited to that meeting because God couldn't say with Lucifer there, I'm going to let us make man in our image. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't be the right thing to say. And leaving Lucifer out now caused him his pride and his um, not in non-inclusion in that meeting to come forward and come into the open and make a complaint. So first thing that God was dealing with here was the maligning of his own character. So Satan was misrepresenting God. What do we say that is? 
That's treason. Do we do that at times? Do we misrepresent God? What is it? It's treason. What does it deserve? Death. Yes. We're all guilty. We sit here and we're all guilty of being misrepresenting God. Now, if we go on in another step, I want you to follow me, follow the story distinctly. God needed to reveal who Satan was without resorting to his methods to bring an end to this controversy. And that's what this whole thing is about, what we're talking about here. So, I'm calling the meeting with Jesus Christ. He knew that there was going to be a reaction in Satan because he was left out. Lucifer was left out of the meeting, and now there was a controversy coming forth. But why did God need to make man in his own image? Did God have a reason for that, for that particular thing? Because someone has said there are 99 other worlds because the Bible says in Luke that he left the 90 and 90 and he came to this world. So there must be at least 99 other worlds and this is the 100th one and, and Christ came here. Now I don't know if that's true and if I'm faithful I'll find out maybe how many other worlds there are. But Jesus said something similar and it implies that there are other worlds. And we'll look at that in a moment also. But now, so God's character was being maligned. How could he, who is totally a spiritual being, reveal who he really was to a physical world, to a material world? Well, he needed a material representation of himself. So in order to meet the challenge of the adversary, God thought ahead. He planned ahead that he was going to show the universe who he really was in a material, you might say a carbon-based um, entity of who he really was and who he really is. And that's why we've been called into existence, to be a physical representation of this spiritual God who rules the universe. That's what the Bible tells us. We're here for that purpose. God created us for that purpose. Now, as we look forward and we see what happened in the heavenly courts, there was this controversy. And God now called, because Satan had reacted to that meeting, God calls another meeting of the whole assembly of his host in heaven. And in that meeting, we read it in the spirit of prophecy very clearly, that God said, my son is the one to whom I relegate all authority and power. And from that meeting, um, Satan left with the promise that he would never again bow to the Son of God. That was his promise to himself, and he's kept that promise to this day. And because of that, there was war in heaven, and what happened? There was a great division. At one time, Sister White writes, almost half the angels were on Satan's side, but eventually, as the thing developed, only one-third of the angels left with him and went out of heaven, were kicked out of heaven. So what happens outside of heaven? Well, we see that um, he repents to some degree, and he comes knocking on the door of heaven, and he calls for Jesus, and... Uh, Satan is asked, asked Jesus if he can come back in, and he says, I'll be willing to take my place back again. Uh, I'm sorry for all the things that happened, but, but uh, if you'll please uh, forgive me and, and let me in, I promise it won't happen again. What does God do? He says that uh, Satan has gone too far in his rebellion, and uh, Jesus in that situation actually cries. Okay, thank you for that reference. That's very nice. I'm glad you've read the text. But you see, let's point out two things. If God says, yes, you can come back in, he already knows that his repentance is not real. Yes. But how does he prove it? I'll answer that in a moment. Okay? So if, if let's just say in a scenario that God would say that he could come back in and he knows that he's going to continue his rebellion, Satan will now say, Lucifer will say, see, I told you, if I was wrong, why did God kick me out in the first place? Yeah. He, I told you it was inconsistent, and I, I'm a case in point. I, I approve it to you. He kicked me out, now he let me back in. Which is it? I've shown you that you need to decide your own 
uh, destiny. You are your own God because God doesn't even know what he's doing. So if God let him back in, he would, might make such arguments. But now that God said no, what does Satan say? See, I told you he's arbitrary, he's authoritarian, he's unforgiving, and you don't deserve to serve, serve such a God because that's who he is. Actually, Satan is talking about himself more than God. So God could not win. Do you, have you ever felt that no matter what you did, this or that, you were, you were in trouble? Yeah. You couldn't do right no matter what you did. And that's the position that Satan wants to put us all in. And that's the tri what he tried to do to put God in that situation. But now how is God going to reveal who Satan's character really is? Well, he's going to go forward with his plan to create this world and put man on it because in that situation, he's going to reveal the true character of Satan's repentance. Let's jump forward for a moment to give you that example. At the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Satan was permitted to come. And the reason he was permitted to come there, in my estimation, was to reveal whether or not he had repented or not. Because if he had repented, what would he have said to Eve? Don't eat from this tree. Don't stand in rebellion against God. Because the results of that are eternal darkness and ruin. But did he say that? No. He didn't say that. So God in that moment proved, without saying anything, that Satan's repentance was false. So you see that at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God had a bigger picture, a bigger idea to, to take care of. Now, about the idea of what's going on in this great controversy, I want to go to probably the first book that was ever written in the Bible, which is that book, Job. Job may have been the first book ever written. Um, we're going to go to chapter 38, and we're going to look at something... Um, interesting there because the question is often asked are there other worlds when God created this world was Satan had, had Satan already fallen and when you read uh, the evangelists today they do not believe that uh, the worlds and all the things were created before this world came into existence they believe that all the star universe and everything came into existence at the same time that the universe is 6,000 years old etc I'm not sure I can accept that theory, but some of even our own brethren believe that. But let's look at uh, something here in chapter 38 of Job. God asked Job in verse 4, Whence, where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare, if thou understand. Of course, this is a rhetorical question, we'd say, and we know the answer to that. We weren't there. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? So God is asking some questions here that are a mystery to us, which men have sought to find out over time. And it is kind of one of the things that pleases men to look into. Verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, and who the, laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sing together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, who are these morning stars, um, or all these stars, all the morning stars, and who are these sons of God? Have any idea? Well, we read in Revelation, um, chapter 12, verses 4 and 9, uh, that the angels are symbolized by stars. So could this be the stars, the angels that were there, when were they there? Were they there when the earth was created? They were already there, according to what it says. Now, who are the sons of God? This has been a, quite a controversy of who the sons of God are, and there are different definitions of who the sons of God are. In the scriptures, um, in the book of Genesis and so forth, we believe that the sons of God are those who followed the Lord, who were faithful to God. But who are these sons of God that were spoken of here? in the book of Job, before there were any men on the earth. Because it's talking about a chorus that's singing um, even before there was, uh, or right when man was first created. Let's look now at Luke, 
if you will, please. We're going to look at Luke chapter 3, verse 38. And here we have the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Luke. And we know what it says. We'll begin in verse 37. Which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jard, which was the son of Malaliel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So we find here that Adam is called what? Son of God. Why was he called Son of God? Did he have father and mother? No, I, I wonder if he had a navel. I don't know. He, needed, he didn't need an umbilical cord. But I believe that God created him with one, even though he was never born. Yes, Leo? I was going to mention also in Matthew 5, uh, the Beatitudes, we see in um, where it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Okay, the peacemakers shall be called the sons of God. And we find that we now, looking at the gospel, what has God made us through the gospel? Though lost in Adam, we have been made the sons of God in Jesus Christ. He is the first begotten, and we are his brothers and sisters, right? So we have, blessed are the peacemakers, those who make, uh, bring peace upon earth. earth. Sister White writes in a, one testimony that those who bring people to reconciliation to God are the peacemakers. So they become also sons of God. But the point here we're making is the sons of God here imply that there are other worlds and the first created beings of those worlds are the sons of God also. Because we see in Job that when God created the world, what did the sons of God do? They rejoiced. There was a chorus. You might say there was a choir of the sons of God and the angels. Well, if you will... Um, go now to Genesis chapter 1 again and think about this. Chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What happened when God finished his creation, according to Job? What happened then? The morning stars sang to uh, gather, and the sons of God shouted for joy. When do you think this was? We'll read verse... Chapter 2, verse 1, When thus the heavens were, and the earth were finished, and the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So God was resting on this day, and what were the sons of God and the morning stars doing? They were singing. So if we put together Job 38 and this chapter here, and this, these verses, we see that on that day when God was resting, what was heaven doing? All the sons of God and all the angels there were shouting and singing for joy and rejoicing in the creation which God had made. You get the picture? Very interesting, isn't it, to see that? This shows us that what God did on this day when he created the worlds, on this week, the angels were also watching, and when it was finished, they also rejoiced. The other worlds the leaders of the other worlds, the first created beings of the other worlds as Adam was. So now we see that man is upon the earth and he's sent forth to uh, till the, the soil and take care of the garden. And we see that uh, in chapter 3, uh, some days, weeks, months, maybe years later, we don't know. How long was it between his creation and the temptation? We do not know. There's no indication of how long it was. I don't think it was the next day, however. I think God had uh, talked with Adam and instructed him over time and that he had matured because when Adam was created, he was created in, in, uh, innocent and, and perfect in that sense. But he was kind of like a, um, he, he had some kind of knowledge. He could speak, he could name the animals, he could see and take care of things. But he hadn't really developed fully his character. And Sister White writes also in the Steps of Christ that by obedience, Adam could form a perfect character, implying that he had not yet developed habits because he hadn't done anything much. So he needed to develop those habits that would be a reflection of his creator. And God was there to instruct and help him to do that. But the whole story we know a little bit about. So 
Let's think now further in this great controversy, what is happening here, and summarize what we've learned. So there was a time that came in the heart of Lucifer of pride, and he began to be forgetful that he was actually a created being, and he wanted to have what God had, what Jesus had, and because of that, God had to take things in his own hands in a certain condition, in a certain way, and reveal his true character. His purpose in creating man was to reveal his true character to the universe in a, um, a physical way. And so he created this world, or he made the plan, and that brought controversy in heaven because Lucifer could not be invited in that meeting. Then we see that there was war over that because Lucifer would not bow down to Jesus Christ anymore because God had said, my son, I've given him full authority to take care of this project and to manage things. And Lucifer wouldn't accept that. And that's where the war became uh, an open thing. And we saw that his repentance was not real, and that was revealed in the Garden of Eden. And now we have this controversy that has been brought here to earth. Now, what do we find after man sinned? What changed? What things changed? Well, he had to go through a lot more pain and suffering than before. Okay, man lost life, he lost character, he lost his home, and he lost dominion over the world. Yeah. He lost those four things. So now, we go back to the book of Job. What do we see in the first verses of the book of Job? Verse 6, actually. Now there was a day when the sons of God, well, there's the sons of God again. Remember in the chapter 38, where were the sons of God? When was that? When did that happen? That was at creation. When does this meeting happen? There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who was there? Satan was there among them. How did he get there? I thought he was kicked out of heaven. How did he get there? Yeah, I thought he was not permitted back in heaven. He repented and Jesus said, no, you can't come back in. But now it says the sons of God came together and Satan was there among them. How did he get back in? When man sinned, what happened? He lost dominion of the world. He lost dominion of the world. When Satan was tempting Christ in the wilderness, was he lying when he said, all these things have been delivered unto me? No. Who delivered them unto him? Adam. He got it by subterfuge, by usurpation, but they, Christ didn't de de challenge his words. He challenged his authority. Right? He was going to take it back by going where? To the grave. But he didn't reveal that there. So we see that Satan was there and was among them. When did this happen? When was this meeting? Got any idea? Had to be during the time of Job, right? When did Job live? Well, he lived sometime... In the antediluvian world. No, Job didn't live in the antediluvian world. He's probably one of the children of Issachar. Oh. You do the research, you'll find that he... He probably was not one of the people that was in Egyptian bondage. He may have left Egypt before, or his parentage may have left Egypt, 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 Egypt before that he uh, went into bondage. So he lived in the, uh, um, it says, uh, in the land of Uz, wherever that was. How come we see references uh, to um, dinosaur like creatures in Job then? And most people understand that dinosaurs were only before the ark, well, before the flood, and after the flood, uh, they must not have entered the ark, or they must have become as extinct around that time. Well, you know, uh, Richard, there is evidence even in our modern world of dinosaurs, living dinosaurs. Hmm. They're not called as such, but we, saw, uh, we see Leviathan and so forth, and we have different explanations of that. We have great uh, stories of knights who went out to kill uh, dragons and so forth. Um, we have breathing, uh, stories of breathing dragons in China and different places. 
that it is possible that um, dinosaurs uh, survived the flood, maybe even on the ark, we don't know. Uh, but if you do some research, there has been quite a few stories about dragons and so forth. Okay. In, in the Bible, uh, there aren't so many things like that, but in folklore there are. We won't go into the subject of dinosaurs at this point, but sure. Job lived sometime before Mos uh, Moses lived, or yes. approximately at his time. Do you have any evidence for the, the Issachar argument? Because Yes, I, I do. I, I can give it to you at another time. Sure, that's no problem. All right, so we find that uh, Job was known by, at least by Moses, and he wrote the story of of uh, Job, and what we're trying to pin down is where approximately this meeting happened, but it must have happened sometime before uh, the Exodus, before Moses went to Egypt. But now we read the story of Job and what how he afflicts, uh, he's afflicted by Satan, and we come to chapter two again. In verse 1, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. And he's going to report to God what he's accomplished, and we're going to see the other things. The point here is we're looking at there was a meeting of the sons of God, and then there was another meeting of the sons of God. I kind of picture these meetings to be one month apart, because it says in the New Testament that we're going to meet, uh, actually in Isaiah, we're going to meet before the Lord how often? Every Sabbath and every new moon, right? So there's going to be a monthly meeting as well. I believe this is the monthly meeting of the sons of God. There's a monthly meeting where they came together and Satan came before them. So we see that Satan was there and he had access to the throne of God through his usurpation of authority here on earth. He couldn't get back in by permission, so how did he get back into heaven? by subterfuge, by uh, um, taking care of Adam and Eve uh, the way he did. So, what have we learned so far? Uh, what can we uh, summarize? That the creation of the world has something to do with the conflict that was going on in heaven and God's uh, desire or his plan to unmask the adversary and reveal his true character before the universe. And he's doing that by steps, by definite plan. And we see that Satan's own efforts to unmask God are only unmasking himself. Because we can do nothing against God, only for God. But we have to realize, God cannot lower himself to use the methods of the evil one. He must go in a different direction. So, my brothers and sisters, my children, if you will, think about this most important lesson. We must work in a way that is compatible with the character of God. We cannot further the kingdom of heaven by using the methods of the enemy. So let's remember that in our work, and we'll continue this saga, this story, this epic, in our next lesson as we study the great controversy and what's back in back of Revelation chapter 12 because we have much more to say about this subject. So we'll take a break and we'll pick it up on the other side. Thank you. God bless.